Thank you for tuning in to this lecture on Alan J. Pakula's The Parallax View, a neo-noir film that combines the tropes of the past with new literary ideas of the modern age. As with my other lectures, there will be plenty of spoilers here, so please watch the film first before proceeding. Neo-noir is a term that loosely applies to movies that came after the golden age of the film noir. Neo-noir films can be identified occasionally by the costuming and the music, which may reflect contemporary styles and tastes. Another way they can be identified is in the shooting style, which might deviate from the studio setups we see in golden age era pictures. In today's movie, you will definitely see this deviation with its handheld camera work, documentary style lighting, and an avoidance of the studio set as a location. The primary mode of filmmaking that you will see in this movie is that of cinema verite, literally truth in film, a more radical and updated realist movement that was borrowed from the world of the documentary and which became immensely popular in the late 60s and early 70s. This style sought to show events on screen to be very similar to real life. You can identify this filmmaking style by its shaky camera work, erratic and nonlinear editing, and natural sound. Often in these movies, there was an effort to not manipulate the actor's work in the scene. Today, cinema verite is used as a style, like in reality TV, game shows, and social media posts. Seen through the frame of a periodized history book, the 60s were indeed a troubling decade for the country, and a heavy palette from which filmmakers and artists could explore our frustrating history. Many historians view the 60s as the end of a honeymoon of ideals and the beginning of a self-reflexive period where public consciousness was shifting to a realm of self-scrutiny, guilt, and paranoia. The safety and security of the world's countries were under threat, and Americans also found themselves more and more distrustful of their government. This fractured sense of national identity was reflected in the avant-garde new wave films, emerging first from France and soon in other countries like Japan, the US, and Czechoslovakia. Film noir in the 70s reflected this turmoil too, in the manner of the new Hollywood films that emerged from the French New Wave. Movies like Easy Rider, Night of the Living Dead, and Nashville are associated with this era of filmmaking, which overtly broke a movie's expected linear mode of storytelling, felt more like documentaries, and elicited discomforting audience reactions and irresolute endings. Thanks as well to the relaxing of the Hollywood production code and the adoption of cinema verite, the acting styles popular in the 70s also started to feel less staged and more true to life. The movie started to look and feel different. The shattering of the idealized impression we had of history was complemented by a dismantling of classic Hollywood production practices. Audience demographics also played a big part in the shift of the film's look over time, with broadcast TV bringing into the home an unhealthy diet of overwhelming current events and depictions of political strife. A more college-educated crowd went to the movies in greater numbers, and the shared community experience of watching movies became more angry, transparent, and almost protest-oriented. And that's when a director like Alan J. Pakula stepped in. America, which had experienced three major assassinations in the span of five years, was reeling in such a way a story like The Parallax View, based on Lauren Singer's 1970 novel by the same name, was a much-needed response. The movie's allegorical likeness, Jim Davis's Hammond to Bobby Kennedy's, whose assassination occurred just five years prior, is not lost on an audience even viewing the movie today. What's powerful about this movie is that it taps into the existing tropes of noir, but then adds to it. It sort of updates noir while deviating slightly. It is set in the Seattle area, but it is not primarily shot in the middle of the big city. In fact, many scenes evoke a Western's aesthetic, taking place outdoors in more wild conditions. There's even a scene in a Western-themed dive bar. Let's analyze this movie by first breaking down the production design. The Parallax View is a well-designed movie. And by designed, I mean that the props, the selection of sets, and the interesting compositions seem purposely planned, thought out, and communicated to the editing team, who cut this movie together. This movie is obsessed with the wide shot, for example. Many of the film's scenes feature a human subject trapped in the frame by lines and objects. The camera team went to great lengths to compose these shots that were quite difficult to orchestrate. These design elements served to paint a portrait of character vulnerability and entrapment. Let's talk about composition and film editing together. The Parallax View tells its story visually with a series of juxtapositions, the direct or indirect association of images on screen. 
When two or more images are cut or dissolved together, or even placed together in a movie, we know that the filmmakers want the viewer to associate these images. They aren't random. They are a way that filmmakers answer important questions non-verbally or create visual tension in a film. Direct juxtaposition doesn't take place in editing. It is done in camera and within the take. Parallax's first shot features an awesome in-camera juxtaposition, revealing a major symbol for the film. The Native American totem pole and the Seattle Space Needle are both a large, human-made symbol of achievement, both large in frame, dwarfing the people who created it below. One represents Native American culture and the other Western European culture. It creates a clash, not just in what we know from historical record, but also in its aesthetic value of being similarly shaped. Indirect juxtaposition happens in the editing. When you have a scene or shot that presents one idea, and it cuts or dissolves to a contrasting idea, we interpret this as a message of sorts as well. This sort of edit is what we also call juxtaposition in film. If a particular juxtaposition is seen to be very contrasting or very extreme, causing a clash or something very visceral that we remember, we give a special name to it, and that name is dissonance. Some juxtapositions or edits can be complementary, but others can be jarring. Dissonance is a vehicle that writers use to hash out certain themes. Themes of life, death, the law, and criminality is often rested within a film noir. Let's look at how dissonance is used to great effect in Pakula's film. A major theme of the parallax view is man's mortality. In the scenes where beloved characters die, the death is quite unceremonious. It is almost the antithesis of opera, where the death is sudden and inexplicable. In the first instance, Lee Carter, played by Paula Prentice, goes to Frady's place in a scene that foreshadows her own death. Frady and Carter embrace in the preceding scene, and boom, in the very next one, in the very next shot, she is dead. This is not just very sad because we do care about her, but also emotionally intense because the cut is very jarring visually. Similarly, when Bill Rintels dies, he also dies between cuts of the frame. He is alive in one shot, and then it cuts immediately to the next day as he lays dead in his office. The audience is left helpless because we really don't get the privileged, omniscient view here. We are just as lost and dumbfounded as the real characters who would have found his body the following day. In this way, a dissonance is created where scenes of characters being alive are immediately smash cut with scenes where the same character is dead. This sort of indirect juxtaposition is dissonant because it creates an unsettling feeling for the viewer. Let's take a look at the scene again at the Gorge Dam. The Gorge Dam scene is probably one of the film's most memorable sound sequences and simply a strange fight scene in general. They could have filmed this in a variety of ways, but what's so cool is the way the fight is punched up by the sounds of a deafening alarm and, of course, the sound of the water. The harshness of the sound editing in the scene is a good example of audio dissonance. The extreme sound that you hear of the water accentuates its massive size and frame, and we cut back and forth between these magnificent wides with the sound of rushing water to the men fighting at the bottom of the gorge. The audio dissonance caused by the hard cut to the water and the sudden audio difference of the surrounds is very noticeable and memorable for the viewer. Another motif or theme in the parallax view that the gorge dam scene represents is that of man being dwarfed by his surroundings. Think about the movie's plot. Conspiracies and government corruption are byproducts of man's hierarchical infrastructures, clearly very big issues that almost no single person can deal with. To represent this visually, Pakula chooses to juxtapose, or compose if you will, images where the difference between the subject and the background is itself the statement. The magnitude of the movie's problems are represented by juxtapositions of size within the shot. The tiny people and the vast city below. Human subjects against a massive dam looming in the background. A mosaic of large faces looking down at smaller faces. Even in the first and last shots of the film, with the panel of intimidating government voices, is composed in such a way that the sizes of the characters' heads are small in frame. Ultimately, what the parallax view demonstrates is that you can basically take the genres of the past and repurpose them for today. One could also write an entire paper on the brainwashing scene that occurs near the end of the film as Frady is subjected to a mind-altering movie. 
a jarring patchwork of different snapshots. This sequence itself functions as a mini-movie of coarse, dissonant juxtapositions within the film itself. And this mini-movie is framed as though we are watching it too. Could it be that Pakula is saying that, like the central character, we are being brainwashed as well? To tie our conversation of dissonance together, let's talk about the audio and the music. If you've ever studied music or taken a music class, you may have heard the word dissonant as it applies to music. In music, when tones create a clash of sorts, we call that dissonance. Given the subject matter of this film, perhaps Michael Small's transcendent score, however strange sounding, is quite appropriate. Let me try to reproduce the music here. The rhythmic movement of the lower tones sets up a creepy metronomic sense of dread. And then we hear at the top very dissonant notes. It's almost like they're wrong notes. These pitches are heard over and over again throughout the film, as if to warn the viewer of something horrific that has yet to happen. The underscore continues on, playing something that sounds like patriotic news channel music. And then we hear more dissonant notes. This sort of dissonance is the perfect accompaniment to a movie of this magnitude. The events of the film are very big, yet the score is very minimal and strange. It creates a sense of dread with a simple, pulsating rhythm that drives tension with each progressive scene. The parallax view was made in response to the tumultuous and tragic decade preceding the film. And it was released in a time of increasing political strife in the US. Coming out in June of 1974, this movie preceded the resignation of former President Nixon by just two months. It is really a movie that not only reflected true-to-life events of recent history, but also resonated with current social trauma that always seems to find a voice in film noir. Thanks for watching.